So you're thinking about using silicon carbide JFET transistors in your next design. But have you thought about whether you should go the direct drive route or try a cascode approach? Silicon carbide JFETs with their high switching speeds and low RDS on can vastly improve the power density and power efficiency of many different power conversion applications. But maybe you've also heard that JFETs can be difficult to use because they're normally on and also have a high VSD during dead time. So how do CASCO JFETs make life easier? And how can I take advantage of all the cool features that silicon carbide JFET transistors bring to the table? I'm glad you asked, because we're here to help. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Jonathan Dodge from United SIC, now part of Corvo, joins me to discuss how you can take full advantage of silicon carbide JFET transistors. We delve into the details of these innovative transistors, including what their capacitances look like, how we can control their speed, and how you can combine the benefits of a cascode and directly driven JFET fet in your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from United SIC. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey. Okay, so we're talking about how we can take advantage of silicon carbide JFET transistors today. But Jonathan, before we dig into the details, how do these transistors compare with other technologies on the market today? Well, they are quite different because it's JFET based. So United Silicon Carbide manufactures silicon carbide JFETs that are normally on. Some advantages to that are from the fact that there's no metal oxide gate on the JFET. So that allows the JFET chip size to be smaller. So if you look at the RDS on per chip area, I have a graph of that here. On the vertical axis, that's RDS on per chip area. And then on the horizontal axis, that's the breakdown voltage. You'll see the blue dots. Those represent the latest generation silicon carbide JFETs and CAS codes. And we'll talk about what that is in a minute. You can see that those have the lowest on resistance per chip area for a given breakdown voltage. The next closest technology would be silicon carbide MOSFETs. Those are the black squares, followed by gallium nitride. Those are the orange circles. And then finally by superjunction MOSFET, which are silicon based. The very small RDS on per chip area brings some advantages. One is obviously a cost advantage, but also you have low capacitances. There are other reliability advantages related to eliminating the MOS gate. Namely, there's no drift mechanism with temperature or voltage. And also you can withstand high temperature events like short circuit. As long as the energy is limited, there's no change in parameter. So it's very robust. So Jonathan, the title of this Chalk Talk is Cascode versus Direct Drive. So can we take a closer look at Cascode? Sure. So the CAS code basically takes the normally on silicon carbide JPET and turns it into a composite normally off device. And we do that by combining it with a normally off silicon MOSFET. So they're connected in series and the load current flows through both the JPET and the MOSFET. The JPET gate is attached to the MOSFET source. And so what happens is that the MOSFET is used to switch the source on the JFET. So the way it works is you have the three terminals that you would have with a MOSFET or an IGBT drain gate and source. Whenever the MOSFET is on, it will pull the source potential of the JFET low to about the same potential as the gate. And because it's normally on JFET, that turns it on. And that can happen by either the gate of the MOSFET being turned on or whether the gate is on or off. If you have reverse current flowing, it will flow through that MOSFET body diode or channel, and that collapses the voltage across the MOSFET and turns on the JFET. Now, whenever that MOSFET is off, the voltage on the JFET source node builds up quite fast, exceeds the threshold voltage, and turns off the JFET. So one of the advantages of the cascode construction is that when you have reverse current flowing and the gate is off, 
the current flows through the body diode of that MOSFET. Well, it's silicon-based, so it has a low voltage drop in that mode, which is nice, especially for soft switching. It only comes into play during the dead time. It's so more of a minor point, but it's a nice feature. It is a 30-volt MOSFET in there, so its on-resistance is very low, and it's also low cost. So that MOSFET is designed to have about 5 to 10% of the RDS on of the JFET. So that means that most of the heat generated is in the silicon carbide JFET where you want it. The MOSFET itself has conduction loss and almost no switching loss because all it does is switch the source node of the JFET. So, Jonathan, can you explain to me how is Cascode constructed? Sure. Cascode is two chips, as I mentioned before. And United Silicon Carbide uses silver sintering to attach the JFET chip to the copper lead frame for discrete parts. And if it's a side-by-side, as shown on the left, the MOSFET is actually separate on a ceramic isolator pad. And then there are two sets of source bond wires, one to the MOSFET and one to the JFET. The two bond wires does introduce a more stray inductance in the source, so that's somewhat a disadvantage for the side-by-side construction. So whenever possible, we use the stacked construction where the MOSFET chip is actually attached directly on top of the JPET chip, which is in turn silver centered to the copper lead frame. So that's the stacked configuration. And you can see that by the letter S before the letter C in the part number. That means the chips are stacked. So what is the capacitance story here? So the capacitances are quite different in a cascode, especially because the drain to source capacitance of the JFET is practically zero. So this is very unique. And it's because there's no PN junction in the conduction path of the JFET. And there's nothing in the design of the JFET to introduce a drain to source capacitance. That's very little. So what it means is that the drain to gate capacitance of the cascode is also practically zero. It's also known as the reverse transfer capacitance, the CRSS. And if you look at the little circuit diagram on the right, you'll see there's no capacitance across the JFET drain to source. There is capacitance on the MOSFET drain to gate, but zero capacitance in series with another capacitance is still almost zero capacitance. So this is an advantage, but also a disadvantage. We'll get into that in a minute. The output capacitance of the CAS code, interestingly, is approximately equal to the JFET gate to drain capacitance. And that's because there's no drain to source capacitance. And the JFET gate to source capacitance is shunted to the source. The input capacitance comes entirely from the MOSFET. So, Jonathan, what about controlling the speed of CAS code? Yeah, this is a good question. The Casco tends to turn off very fast. Turn on speed tends to be more typical, but turn off is quite fast. And what's happening is if you look at the little circuit diagram on the right there inside the box, that's a Casco that is turning off. So there's still some current flowing through the channel of the JFET and the MOSFET, but it's beginning to divert through the JFET gate to drain, which is your output capacitance. And it flows through the JFET gate resistors built onto the JFET chip. Well, that's part of the chip, and it's not adjustable. So that gives you no control over the speed. That's just inherent speed of the CAS code set by the JFET gate resistor. So you uh, want to slow it down further. You'll need to add some capacitance drain to source to divert current away from the CAS code because you'll see that during turnoff, there's really no current flowing through the MOSFET gate that's charging that JFET gate to drain capacitance. So you need to add an external capacitor to reduce the slew rates. And then if it's a bridge circuit, you would add a resistor in series with that. That helps to reduce the ringing, provide some damping. So this is quite different from a MOSFET or an IGBT because we rely heavily on the snubber. And we've published much information about this in the user guide. There's also a webinar about it and an application note about how to get started using snubbers. So, Jonathan, what about paralleling the CAS code? Sure. So, when paralleling the CAS code, you need to take care that we block high-frequency current path through the gates of the MOSFETs. So, you can see on the left here, there's a high-frequency current path that goes through the gates of the MOSFETs and then 
the source also. And there's not much current really flowing drain to gate because again, that capacitance is almost zero. You also notice that the, any high frequency current that might flow between parallel cast codes is not flowing through the snubbers. It's flowing through the gate and the source. So we need to block that from high frequency. So to do that, we want to make sure that we have individual gate resistors on each cast code. That's normal best practice, but also we strongly recommend adding a ferrite bead to each gate. Now you can use either a separate turn on, turn off gate resistor or combine them. That doesn't matter. But adding the ferrite bead is really important to block that high frequency oscillating current that might be generated otherwise. Usually 100 to 300 ohms at 100 megahertz is enough for that ferrite bead to block any high frequency oscillation current. You can put impedance in the gate or in the Kelvin source. It doesn't matter. What matters is the loop, that there needs to be enough impedance in that gate drive loop. You also need to make sure that you have good DC link capacitors with low inductance connection. That'll help to avoid any oscillation in the DC link. And also make sure that your gate driver has adequate bypassing because you want to avoid voltage dips in the gate drive power supply becoming part of an oscillation. The CAS code itself does have a reverse recovery effect, but it's different from MOSFETs. So if we imagine a high side CAS code was freewheeling, and the low side cast code is turning on. When you have reverse current flowing through the MOSFET, it turns on that JFET. So now we need to turn off that JFET in order for it to block voltage. So it goes through a turn off process at the same time that the lower cast code is turning on. So what happens is they're actually both partially on simultaneously, and that causes the current to overshoot and creates what looks like reverse recovery. There's very little reverse recovery in the MOSFET inside the CAS code itself. There is there is some, but it's small compared to the discharging JFET gate capacitances. Those capacitances are charged through the JFET gate resistor. And so to trade off with the CAS code setting that gate resistor value to be either very low so that you have very little reverse recovery charge or being very high, and then you have very little ringing or oscillation tendency. So that's the trade-off window. So in this waveform chart on the right, you can see inside the black rectangle, the uh, turn-on current overshoots. This is the current in the lower casco that's turning on, and that current is coming from the recovery of the upper cascode as it's turning off. It is independent of temperature because it is a capacitive effect, and interestingly, it's also relatively independent of current. So in this waveform, we're switching 130 amps at 800 volts, which is impressive. And you can see that the reverse recovery effect is modest here. But if you were to switch at, say, 30 amps instead of 130 amps, you would have almost the same peak current. And so it looks quite different at low current. So this is one of the reasons why... If you look at the data sheets for CAS code, you'll see there's an offset in the turn on switching loss versus current. So at very low current, you'll still see kind of a high offset in the turn on switching energy. And it's because of this reverse recovery effect. So Jonathan, what about speed control when it comes to the JFET? Yeah, this is quite different from the CAS code because with the JFET, there's no drain to source capacitance. So your drain to gate capacitance becomes your output capacitance. And when you're switching off, for example, as in this case, uh, the little circuit diagram on the right, we still have a little bit of load current flowing through the JFET, but it's beginning to turn off and that current is diverting through the output capacitance and then it flows through the gate driver. Now all of that current is flowing through the gate driver and instead of being supplied by the load. So you have complete control over the slew rates of the JFET simply by adjusting, for example, the gate resistance value. So therefore, no snubber is necessary. There's no need to add a drain source snubber because you control the slew rates directly with the gate drive. And it also makes them very easy to parallel because you're going to have the gate impedance that you use to set your switching speed is sufficient to prevent any parallel oscillation. The drawback is your gate charge is going to be higher. Okay, so one of the big advantages of direct driving the JFET is that we can eliminate the reverse recovery charge effect. 
that the CAS code has. And the reason for that is if you imagine a high side JFET and there's a MOSFET there, but now it's not a CAS code because the gate of the JFET is not tied to the MOSFET. So the MOSFET is simply left on. So you think of that as an enable MOSFET. So it's not really part of the circuit. It's just left on. Same with the low side JFET MOSFET pair. MOSFET's just left on. So during the freewheeling period, you have current flowing in the reverse direction through the MOSFET and the JFET. But then during the dead time, the JFET turns off. And it's off before the low side J2 turns on. So there's no charging, discharging of the freewheeling JFET capacitance. It's already off. So there's no reverse recovery charge effect. You can see inside the black square on the right, the reverse recovery charge is very small. There's just a little bit of capacitance current flowing through. Like a shot key diode, you don't have the large reverse recovery current flowing. So the turn on switch and loss is very low. And also the turn off loss is low. It's simply a function of how fast you can charge and discharge the JFET gate capacitances. So this is unbeatable in hard switching, direct driving a JFET, because your turn on loss can be very low because of the elimination of the reverse recovery charge. And then also you have control over the turn off switching speed. Now, Jonathan, direct drive of the silicon carbide JFET sounds great. But what's the catch? What is the trade-off here? Right. There is always a trade-off. Uh, you don't get something without giving up something. And so in this case, there is a higher reverse voltage. So the JFET will conduct current in both directions. Even if the gate is off, you can conduct current in the reverse direction. But you will have a higher voltage from source to drain. And that voltage is equal to... A simple way to put it, the amount that you drive the JFET gate to source voltage past the threshold voltage. So being a normally on JFET, it has a negative threshold voltage. So you can see some examples in the chart on the right here. If you have the gate source voltage set to zero, the JFET is on, so there's no knee voltage. But if you have a minus six volts applied and this JFET has a minus five volt threshold voltage, you'll see there's a one volt knee voltage there and so on as you decrease or in other words drive the JFET gate source more negative you'll increase that knee voltage this is only a factor during the dead time so if you have a bridge circuit typically you'll turn one switch on and the other one of course is going to be off and then the one that's freewheeling will turn on so you only have this high voltage during the dead time between the switching on and off of the JFETs. And so depending on the switching frequency, that power loss from this higher voltage drop can be insignificant or it can be significant only if it's a higher switching frequency. So for a motor drive, for example, they typically switch at around 20 kilohertz or less. And in that case, the total switching energy from this higher knee voltage is insignificant. And, of course, in solid-state circuit breakers and relays, it's not a factor at all. If you need to switch at higher frequency, you can add a small anti-parallel diode, and it only needs to handle the peak current because the average current is very small because, again, it only applies during the dead time, which is a very short time. So, Jonathan, what if we need to reduce our RDS on? How can the JFET help here? So this is the real strength of the JFET because... As we mentioned before, it already has very low on resistance per chip area, lower than any other device type in these voltage ratings. But you can actually further reduce it. And this is what I call low-hanging fruit. It's very easy to pick. What you do is you drive the JFET gates slightly positive, about 2 volts, and that will result in an additional 15% reduction in on resistance. It will also help you to turn on the JFET faster, and there's no effect on the turn off. What you're doing when you overdrive, I call it overdriving, you drive positive the JFET gate source voltage a little bit. You're further enhancing the JFET channel, and that's the reason for the reduction in that on resistance. And there's no significant injection of minority carriers as there would be like in a bipolar transistor. The current involved is very small that you're injecting in. You're not quite breaking over the PN junction voltage. You're just further enhancing the channel of the JFET. 
This is a very simple way to significantly improve your efficiency. Fantastic. Now, is there a positive VGS limit for the JFET? Yes, there is. You keep it below about three volts. It depends on the temperature. So you can see in the chart here, gate current versus gate voltage at different temperatures here. If the chip is hot, you'll want to stay below about two volts. If the chip is cooler, then you can push that voltage higher. That's why we recommend about two volts. And then you don't need to worry about the chip temperature. You're not going to harm the junction of this JFET. It can handle amps of current without damage. And when you're overdriving by two volts, you're only going to be pushing in milliamps of current. So that's not a concern. The interesting thing that you can do as you're overdriving, you can also at the same time measure the temperature of the JFET chip because you can use the PN junction of the JFET gate as a temperature sensitive parameter. And so for the generation 3 12 volt JFET, for example, it has a very well defined temperature coefficient about minus 3.22 millivolts per degree C. So that's something that you can use to measure real time on ship temperature. It's a real advantage. Great. Now, how does CAS code compare with the JFET? Yeah, so to summarize some of the advantages and disadvantages, I would say that, of course, the CAS code is normally off. That's the whole reason for making a CAS code. And because you're driving a MOSFET, it has a flexible gate drive voltage range. So the MOSFETs used in the United Silicon Carbide CAS codes are actually designed by United Silicon Carbide with a threshold voltage of near 5 volts at room temperature, which makes it very easy to use them in bridge circuits. And again, the CAS code has low gate charge. And that's because you're only driving the MOSFET gate charge. The rest of the gate charge is supplied by the load. This is particularly attractive for soft switch circuits where that energy actually gets recycled. CAS code disadvantage. The biggest one is the limited speed control because the charging, discharging of the output capacitance is not through the gate resistor. It's through external components drained to source. And the other disadvantage is the reverse recovery charge effect when you're hard switching and you have CAS codes connected in series in a bridge circuit. JFET advantage, direct speed control because your output capacitance is charged and discharged by the gate drive itself and not by the load. Another big advantage, there's no reverse recovery charge. Turn on loss can be very low, unbeatable. And you can further reduce the already low RDS on by overdriving with a couple of volts. Now, of course, the obvious disadvantage for JFETs is that it's normally on. There are some applications actually where they want normally on, but most want normally off. So we would combine it with a MOSFET in some manner to make it normally off. And I'll show you an example with the direct driven MOSFET scheme. Also, you have the high source drain voltage during the dead time. So is there a way to combine the benefits of a CAS code and a directly driven JFET? Yes, and th this is to direct drive the JFET gate. And this brings out the benefits of both. So especially if you were to stack the MOSFET chip on top of the JFET like we do with the CAS code, but don't tie the JFET gate to the source. Just bring it out separately and drive it directly. Then you use the MOSFET as an enabler, you just turn it on and leave it on. So this gives you the benefits of the low on resistance. You can overdrive it and you get the low turn on switching loss and also a very stable, very easy to control device. So what does the direct drive look like? Can you show us an example of it in action? Sure. Yeah, I have a circuit here showing a couple of gate drivers and it's simpler than it might look at first glance. On the right, we have a JFET MOSFET pair. The JFET is being driven by a gate driver through a buffer stage. So the reason for doing that is that we're using off the shelf components here and you can actually use a gate driver that has the DSAT protection feature those gate drivers require a positive voltage of at least 12 volts, usually 15 volts, but we don't want to overdrive the gate 
of the JFET with that much voltage. We only want two volts. So we need to drop that voltage down. So what we do is we take the output of our gate driver U1 and we connect it to a MOSFET. So this upper MOSFET inside of Q1, this is just used as a voltage shifter. So the beauty of a MOSFET is that you can drive its gate with plus minus 15 volts, for example, but only apply two volts to the drain and it will work fine. And that's what we're doing here. So we're using that MOSFET as a voltage reducer so that output of this buffer stage, it's a source follower, driving the gate of the JFET will only drive it to positive two volts. So the lower MOSFET inside of Q1, this buffer is optional because this gate driver has its own uh, separate off output pin. But if you want a higher current drive to your JFET, you can include this and then you can drive multiple parallel JFETs. The way that you would protect it in case you have DC link voltage, but you lose your control power, you want it to revert to cascode action where the JFET gate is connected to the MOSFET source. And you can do that with a couple of Zener diodes. Now, normally these never conduct. They don't get involved, but it would if you were to lose control power and you had a high voltage on a DC link. The uh, gate current would go through D2 and that would pin a D2 low and that would turn off the JFET just as if it were a cascode. The other Zener diode, basically, that just allows you to overdrive the gate with a couple of volts. Now, just to summarize really quickly, this is all off-the-shelf components. The uh, MOSFET itself, the enable MOSFET, is driven by a separate gate driver. Each gate driver has its own isolation barrier inside. They can actually share the positive gate drive voltage. You just need a voltage regulator to drop the 15 volts down to 2 volts for this buffer Q1 to overdrive the JFET. What else can we do with this configuration? There's actually a second method that you can use to sense temperature. If the JFET and MOSFET are stacked, when you enable this MOSFET, you just turn it on and leave it on at system power up, for example. So the value of that gate resistor going to that MOSFET can be quite large. It doesn't really matter what its value is, but you can sense the voltage drop across it, and that will tell you the amount of leakage current going into the electrostatic discharge protection diodes that are built into this MOSFET gate. So those ESD diodes become your temperature-sensitive parameter, the leakage current, and that's easy to characterize. You'll probably need to calibrate for each device, but once you do that, then you know precisely what your temperature is of the MOSFET. And because it's attached on top of the JPET chip, it's going to be slightly hotter than the JPET chip. And the, the beauty of this is that that MOSFET stays on, so there's no need to worry about blanking time or blocking voltage. You can just measure the MOSFET gate resistor voltage drop and tell what your chip temperature is real time on the chip, no delay. And it's a very simple thing to do. You can just use a differential amplifier to do that. All right. Well, Jonathan, this has been a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? Sure. So when comparing the CAS code with the direct drive, the direct drive of the silicon carbide JFET, when used with an enable MOSFET, you can make it have a safe off state by adding a couple of Zener diodes that we showed in our schematic. You have very low on resistance and you can overdrive and have even lower on resistance. We can do this all with off the shelf gate drivers, including a DSAT feature. And we have very low switching loss. We've eliminated the reverse recovery charge and our turn on loss is quite low. Direct speed control comes through the gate drive for the JFET. We mentioned two ways of sensing temperature. One is on the JFET chip itself using the JFET gate to source diode as a temperature sensitive parameter, or you can measure the leakage current in the ESD diode to the MOSFET. It's a very simple assembly with stacked chips. They can be put into discrete parts or into modules. This benefits high current and high reliability applications such as solid state circuit breakers or relays, you can handle very high peak currents with no degradation in any parameter, no change in threshold voltage, no change in leakage current, et cetera. It's also very attractive for EV motor drives because again, it's very high current and you have the elimination of the reverse recovery charge, the turn on loss is very low and you have very low on resistance. 
And when you're talking about low on resistance, you also need to think about the chip area because you can theoretically get to any on resistance you want to by paralleling chips. But when your JFET chip is half the size of a competing chip, you're going to have a smaller system in addition to lower cost. So it's very compelling. Excellent. Well, Jonathan, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from United SIC. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. If you can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or check out YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.